This recording is going to cover some clinical correlations associated with lectures that cover introduction to the nervous system. We're going to be looking at meningitis, uh, also looking at uh, in, in, intracranial hypertension and hydrocephalus, as well as fractures of cribriform plate, which can cause leakage of the CSF, um, and also looking at the role of lumbar punctures in diagnosis and treatment in various conditions. So let's start with meningitis. So meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges. The uh, meninges, when they become infected and inflamed, they swell and that can result in various signs and symptoms. Now the most common cause of menin meningitis is virus, a virus, but it can also be caused by bacteria, parasites, or even fungus, or fungi, I should say, fungi. Um, some of the symptoms, you can see some of the symptoms associated with it. People may not have all those symptoms. They don't necessarily go in a particular order. Um, it may, may be different between babies and adults, some, dif some slight differences. But the, the, the key is, is this is a very serious condition. The meningitis can kill within 24 hours. And it's about one in 10 will die from meningitis and about one in four will suffer long-term effects from it. Um, I had one semester, I had two different students that were in my class, both of which had children that had meningitis. One of them, their child died as a result of it very quickly. The child died from onset of it to when they died. The other one, the, their child survived, but did suffer long-term effects as a result of it. So it um, resulted in some damage to the prefrontal cortex in the brain. And later we'll learn about what are some of the functions of that prefrontal cortex. So what they can do, one of the like diagnostic features of meningitis is they will do a lumbar puncture. A lumbar puncture is also referred to as a spinal tap. What they'll do is they insert a needle into the subarachnoid space and they want to go and, and get um, extract some cerebral spinal fluid. Now it's important to realize where how a lumbar puncture is done is they will insert the needle typically between the third and fourth lumbar vertebra um, because in, in it would be say in an adult because the spinal cord ends, you see right here, the spinal cord ends between your first and second lumbar vertebra. But cerebral spinal fluid will continue to circulate past that and they want to inject the needle to a point where they can get the CSF without damaging the spinal cord. So they insert the needle. Sometimes um, if a, um, uh, a anesthesiologist does it, um, you know, they do it by palpation, they'll feel and they'll be able to inject it. If they don't, can't definitively try to figure out by palpation where to feel for those vertebra and do the injection, a radiologist will do the lumbar puncture um, and they utilize some x-rays to try to localize where they need to insert the needle. My daughter had a lumbar puncture. The, um, the anesthesiologist could not do, uh, do it. So we had a radiologist do it, and so I was present while they were doing have her doing the X-rays while they're inserting the needle. Unfortunately, if a radiologist or a um, radiologist does it, there's no anesthesia involved, and so it's uh, they're kind of not like knocked out per se, and so it's a little bit more uncomfortable. So it was an uncomfortable for a a 16 year old to have that done, but she was a trooper and he said that she did a lot better than some of the adults that, that did it. So they inject um, the needle in there and they can extract some cerebral spinal fluid for testing. Cerebral spinal fluid, the composition is different from your blood. Typically cerebral spinal fluid has a higher concentration of sugar, lower concentration of protein. And so someone with meningitis, they will, it'll show like a low sugar level, um, higher protein, but also elevated white blood cells, and but they also can culture it and figure out the culprit, what specifically is causing the meningitis. 
Um, so that is, is often used to check for meningitis. Now my daughter did not have meningitis. She had increased intracranial hypertension, um, which they diagnosed as a result of, the, of doing the spinal tap, but she uh, had evidence of um, increased pressure in the brain, and I'll tell you what it was in a moment. So another thing that the lumbar puncture can be used is to relieve some pressure that's a result of increased intracranial pressure. Hydrocephalus is where you have kind of too much cerebral spinal fluid. You notice that this, this child's, the ventricles are enlarged. Now, in an adult, and you know, depending on the age of the, the person that has this, the skull can't move. And so if you have this increases pressure up here, which you can cause a certain number, certain signs and symptoms. Now in a baby that has fontanelles, that they have those soft spots, the, you'll see, I'll show you a picture of a, a, a baby with fontanelles, they have it, so you see this very large head. Well, hydrocephalus can be caused from an imbalance of production of cerebral spinal fluid or removal of it. And what can result is increased intracranial hypertension. So you have various signs and symptoms. LOC stands for um, changes in levels of consciousness. My daughter had this, papilledema. Going to the regular eye doctor once a year, we always get our eyes checked, gets her prescription changed. The op optometrist noticed she had papilledema, which is swelling of the optic disc. Immediately was referred to a neuro-ophthalmologist, did a laundry list of tests on her, took hours. She had three MRIs, an MRV, which is where they're looking at the venous system in the brain, um, a number of different things. She had a lumbar puncture to try to determine why she had the increased intracranial pressure, because papilledema can be caused from increased intracranial pressure. Well, hers was idiopathic. We don't know the cause. So the cause can be because of you're overproducing it for some reason. There's a blockage in flow. They were, they've eliminated that because they could, didn't find any evidence of blockage of flow. Um, so they just don't know the exact cause of it. So her treatment is she's given medication to help to decrease that production of cerebral spinal fluid. But they did do that lumbar puncture initially to determine if the pressure was elevated. And that pressure, when they went in, I watched it. They had it attached some, something else on the end of uh, the um, tool that they used to measure pressure because their pressure was so high. And then they took a number of different samples to test to see if there was any sort of infection that can cause increased um, pressure, increased cerebral spinal fluid. All those tests came back negative. So we just, she has increased pressure She's overproducing CSF for some reason. She's on medication to de decrease it at this point in time. Now, something else that could potentially cause that um, increase in cranial pressure is something such as this thing called Chiari malformation. This is a condition where you, the brain extends into the spinal canal. So you can kind of see where it's kind of extending down here. That could increase pressure on the brain, increase buildup of cerebral spinal fluid, because it could affect that circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid. So that's something that could um, cause um, increased intracranial pressure and they have to do surgery to fix that. Um, another thing I want to uh, mention is if you have a fracture, a skull fracture, that fractured something called the cribriform plate. This is within the ethmoid bone of your skull. It's one of your cranial bones. Notice the location. So it's very close to your nasal cavity. And so what can happen is you have CSF that's circulating around in here and you have a fracture there. The CSF can leak. That can lead to a CSF leak fracture. The person may not realize they actually have a skull fracture and they may feel like, but why does my nose keep running? And actually after a certain period of time, they can test that and say, no, that's cerebral spinal fluid that's leaking out of your nose. And I actually knew someone that was in an accident 
and you know they didn't really it was they didn't think it was that significant but they did have a skull fracture and didn't realize it and they had a CSF leak and they just kept complaining that their nose was running after a certain period of time if the CSF leaks then you have um, where you'll have headaches and some other problems of that loss of this CSF um, so um, that's what was eventually um, leading them to go see the, the doctor but also a, a thing that you have to be very careful about is because of that fracture this you have a lot of bacteria that can hang out in your nose and that can cause an infection in the brain which is extremely serious so that, that's something to be wary about so this is I just want to talk about some of the clinical correlations associated with it if you have more interest in certain things Google it because you can find a little bit more information about things that you're more interested in.